Yeah, not just the, the NPDS wastewater group. Okay, so at the first July meeting, that would be I'm great. extending out two months. <laughs> Only because you've done such a great job so far. I, I agree with that, but uh, we'll defer it also to my colleagues' comments. I, I just wanted to make uh, one quick comment, and that really is to the stakeholders. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, Tam noted and that stands out in the report is that uh, some of the costs associated with the programs are indirect costs. And so uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, stakeholders will look at, uh, will assume that indirect costs shouldn't somehow be carried by the program, and that was the comment that someone made, I forget which, uh, which stakeholder group. And uh, that, that needs to be a, 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 a good discussion with the stakeholders because as all, anyone who works in any organization, there are indirect costs that are legitimately part of a program. And so I would hate to see the monitoring and, and uh, data that, that helps to guide us as we set our priorities get short changed in this process because that is one of the indirect costs. It's, and the same with, with retirement programs. And so it's just a, a good understanding of what the costs are and that your stakeholder, that your members understand that and, and you know, maybe they uh, will have, certainly will have ways of, of streamlining or in making it more efficient. But I, uh, I do think we shouldn't, um, we, sh we should acknowledge that indirect costs are legitimate costs. I have an amendment to <coughs> my uh, direction to Ms. Turgovich here. It's, it's, uh, we look forward to hearing back from you in July with respect to a game plan, a work plan for completing phase two. But let's put a, a time frame on that as well. I would like to be phase two to be completed, the priority setting, the target setting, you know, all of those to be put in place no later than necessary to start implementation for the next fiscal year. So that would be, I'm sorry, the following fiscal year. So that would be July of 2013. So when you talk to the stakeholder and you develop your work plan, have that in mind. Not that I don't trust everyone to come to consensus quickly, but deadlines always help. So just to clarify, is the, um, the work plan that we would be coming back with this July for the phase two component, you want that report completed by July of 2013 Not with just the report, but anything we need to do. Associated with phase one implementation or phase two, because phase two will likely be a series of recommendations um, related to various programmatic requirements. Phase two. which includes priority setting and target setting of phase one as well. I want it all, Karen. Um, the target setting component is well on its way, as Eric um, displayed for you, and so we are very confident that that will be in place actually for the um, budget year. But you will keep an open mind in case our stakeholders suggest some refinements that may be appropriate. Absolutely. Thank you. Great job again. Thank you. Want to take a breath? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are going to take a five-minute break, and then we'll resume with. I've been asked to take a break. They're half gone. You can read uh, the executive director's report uh, in your uh, binders. Thank you. It's difficult for me to be so sensitive. When somebody asks for something, I just have to capitulate now. I
If you all could take your seats, please. Oh. All right. If you all would take your seats, please. Ladies and gentlemen. Take your seats, please. All those in favor, signify by aye. Thank you. I've been trained to be nice to everybody. I didn't do well in the course. Thank you all. Mr. Howard, if we could hear your executive director's report, please. That's it? You already heard it. All right. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> With that, we're going to move into a public hearing. As you will note, I'm going to repeat part of what I said earlier, but I need to do that to do this in a proper and orderly fashion. Um, good morning and welcome to the public hearing for the receipt of oral comments on a draft water quality control policy for low threat underground storage tank case closure and draft substitute environmental document. I'm Charles Hoppen, Chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Also present are my fellow board members, Francis, Vice Chair Francis Spivey Weber and Member Tam Doduck. I'd like to also introduce our staff present today, Executive Director Tom Howard, Chief Deputy Director Jonathan Bishop, um, Chief Counsel Michael Lawfer, uh, and UST and Site Cleanup Program Section Chief Kevin Graves. Do we have an acronym for that of some sort? We're Kevin, still working on the acronym oh, for good, that. Oh, good, good. We need one. And from the Office of Chief Counsel Lori Brock, um, as many of you heard earlier, um, we have an emergency evacuation procedure. If an alarm goes off, please head down the stairs in an orderly fashion and ask those that were here for the first presentation of the emergency evacuation orders where you're supposed to adjourn to, if you would, please. Uh, from a procedural matter standpoint, this hearing is being held in accordance with the notice of adoption of hearing dated February 3, 2012, and a revised notice of public hearing dated March 20th. 2012 to receive input on a draft policy and a draft substitute environmental document. If you intend to speak on this issue, please fill out a blue speaker's card, give it to Ms. Townsend at the front of the room. If you're not sure if you want to speak, just mark if necessary. I'll call your name. If you decide to decline to come up, that certainly will be your privilege. Uh, the deadline for submittal of written comments on the draft documents was March 19th at 12 noon. If you've already submitted written comments to the board, Please, be, please briefly summarize your comments uh, once it's your turn to speak. Uh, time limits may be imposed on oral comments if necessary to allow all participants the opportunity to be heard. The State Water Board will not take action on this issue today. This hearing is being recorded. Uh, there will not be sworn testimony. I will call the speakers in the orders I've received, the blue cards, with the exception of stakeholder representative who uh, will be given the opportunity to make the first presentation. When you come to the podium, please identify yourself by name and whom it is that you are representing, if it's not yourself. Uh, we will have a staff presentation from Kevin Graves and then public comments. Mr. Graves, would you pl proceed, please? Thank you, Chair Hoppen, members of the board. For the record, I'm Kevin Graves from the Division of Water Quality, and with me today is Lori Brock from the Office of Chief Counsel. The low threat UST case closure policy was developed by a stakeholder group representing regulatory agencies, industry groups, water supply agencies, and the environmental community. This occurred over the course of many months last year, and to do so, the group had to grapple with controversial issues and balance competing perspectives. The group's final document was presented to the board in July of last year. Since that time, board staff prepared a CEQA scoping document held CEQA scoping hearings in both Northern and Southern California. Based upon comments received, staff made clarifying amendments and released the policy and CEQA document for public comment in January of this year. The policy also had a scientific peer review that supported the scientific basis of the policy. The hearing today is intended to receive additional public comment on the policy and the CEQA document. The policy sets criteria which identify sites that pose a low threat to public health, safety, or the environment. Sites that meet these criteria are safe for unrestricted use and development. 
Included in these criteria are requirements that sites be investigated, that sources be removed, groundwater plumes must be stable or decreasing, and public water supply must be available. It recognizes the role of natural attenuation in restoring the beneficial uses of groundwater and allows property owners, water districts, and other interested parties to play a role in the closure decisions that could affect them. The policy does not, however, attempt to describe every situation that might arise. In fact, the policy recognizes this and allows an agency to identify as a site as having unique case-specific or site-specific conditions where the policy should not apply. The board received 42 written comments during the comment period. Staff is preparing written responses to these comments. The policy and CEQA document are currently scheduled for possible adoption by the board at the May 1st board meeting. Thank you. That concludes my staff presentation. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I understand that the stakeholder group will not be making any uh, presentation today. I will call the speakers in the order I've received these cards. David Von Aspern. Good morning. Boy, I guess I did get here early. Good morning, State Water Resources Control Board members. My name is David Von Aspern, and I'm here as a director on behalf of the Groundwater Resources Association of California. GRA is a nonprofit organization of approximately 1,200 groundwater professionals whose mission is resource management that protects and improves groundwater supply and quality. GRA commends the State Water Board for its efforts in shaping this draft low threat USD closure policy and would like to thank State Water Board for the opportunity to testify at this hearing. The State Water Board published the draft closure policy supporting technical justification documents and the associated scoping document addressing CEQA elements of the policy in the summer and fall of 2011. The State Board published the latest version of the closure policy technical justification documents and the substitute environmental document on January 31st. 2012. GRA submitted technical reviews to these comments in our comment letters dated November 8, 2011 and March 19, 2012. GRA has three key comments to express at this hearing. It is impossible to say a priori that cases which meet the general and media specific criteria established in this policy satisfy the case closure requirements of Health and Safety Code Section 2529.6.10 and State Water Board's Resolution 9249. This is because of the wide natural variability between UST sites regarding contaminant plume evolution, vapor migration, nearest exposure receptors, and potential future land use and new water supply wells. By definition, every UST site will not meet the statistical norm, and every UST site will not meet the assumed conditions stated in the closure policy. Therefore, GRA emphasizes that the closure policy should allow for the continued use of site-specific interpretation and evaluation of all data and information to support rational UST site closure decisions. GRA believes that the media-specific criteria should not be part of a State Water Board policy, but rather should be included in a guidance document, most appropriately the California Luft Manual. Such an approach where State Water Board policies remain general in nature and details and specifics are relegated to regulatory guidance will help ensure that the State Water Board policies remain relevant and meaningful over a long period of time. While regulatory guidance can be more easily revised and updated on a periodic basis, State Water Board policies often remain static. The State Water Board scoping document and substitute environmental document appear to have not properly evaluated environmental impacts because they failed to compare the proposed project's impacts with those under the current closure policy. Where a project proposes to alter an existing plan or policy document, a two baselines approach is required. Further, under CEQA, a lead agency is required to make a good faith effort to disclose the environmental impacts of a project to decision makers and the public. By only analyzing existing conditions as the baseline, the scoping document limits the impacts the changes from the existing policy will have on the environment. In closing, GRA thanks you once more for the opportunity to provide testimony at this hearing. I am available for any easy clarifying questions board members might have. Thank you. Thank you, David. Aaron Garner. Thank you, board members. 
Chairman Hoppen, Vice Chair Sp Spivey Weber, and Board Member Dodick, thank you. And uh, Chairman, uh, I wanna say I'm glad you commended your fellow board members this morning at the beginning of the meeting for the hard work they've been putting in with only three of you uh, to go around and, and visit the regional boards. And so I wanted to say thanks to all three of you for the work you've thank been you. putting in and the dedicated service you give to the state. Um, I'm a principal geologist, Aaron Garner, with the Ecologic Group, and I'm here to support to support the low threat closure policy. I recognize there's a need for a standardized statewide guide for applying low threat closures. Uh, I did provide a letter uh, that I'm just summarizing right now, uh, and I did provide it by the deadline. One of the things that uh, I wanted to suggest in terms of slight modifications of the policy, however, one of them is that the, the policy should specifically require compliance with Health and Safety Code section 25296.10. It refers to that section of code, but it doesn't say, it doesn't require compliance with it. If you look at resolution 9249, for instance, resolution 9249 has a long list of codes on which it is based, but this policy does not yet. And I think that it would be beneficial to have specific references, but also specific requirements for compliance, cross-references to other codes and other policies. Um, in, in particular, one of the things it doesn't do is it doesn't require preparation of a corrective action plan. And a corrective action plan is seen throughout California code and regulation uh, for underground tank sites. And uh, my concern is that even though it does talk about site conceptual models or SCMs, a, an SCM is not a corrective action plan. A corrective action plan can contain a site conceptual model, but they're not the same. And so if we don't specifically require preparation of a corrective action plan, there will be a situation, potentially, where responsible parties will say, hey, uh, well, mom said I don't have to do a corrective action plan, or mom says I do have to do a corrective action plan, but dad says I don't have to. That's the danger I think it might we might run into. Um, the institutional control mechanisms that are talked about in the policy, to the degree that we can, it would be great to standardize them so that uh, everybody's using the same kind. And uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is that I talk in my letter about a mitigation fund and perhaps the, the possibility of creating that within the UST fund so that in, in the event, in the situation where they are funded sites that are receiving low threat closure, there can be a reserve account set aside for those sites for the sake of not only following what happens with low threat closures in general, but studying uh, in particular, or uh, studying specific low threat closure sites in the long term. And the reason I bring this up as, as example, uh, San Francisco board recently had a uh, water supply well impacted in uh, South San Francisco. And the closest case that was to this water supply well was a closed MTBE case uh, with, that was closed with pretty low concentrations, but they had to reopen it. And, uh, you know, that's going to happen with some of these low threat closures. It's just going to happen. And I think if we know that it's likely to happen based on the record, then we ought to have some funding allocated for, uh, for that eventuality. And uh, so I'm, I'm recommending it. I, some people will say, oh, well, the responsible party, you can reopen the case and go to the responsible party again. But I think you realize that that puts, that puts the state in a clawback position. You have to then go to the responsible party, argue about whether or not it's suitable to reopen the case, potentially, uh, and then uh, may end up in litigation over who pays for that case, for that study. Rather just have it set aside. 
financial assurance is a longstanding principle in California regulation and legislation. We ought to institute it here. Uh, finally, I, I want to just say that uh, when I talked about uh, referencing regulation and, and statute, I think it's important that we uh, that we stress compliance with all applicable statute. Uh, the Health and Safety Code, Chapter 6.7 does it, Chapter 6.75 does it. They point to the specific codes that they expect compliance with, and this policy ought to do it because I wouldn't want us to be in a situation where we are rewarding recalcitrance. Uh, it's, it's just, it's bad policy if we do that. And so we ought to specifically say that we expect that compliance. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments and your recommendations, Mr. Gunner. Jerry Wickham. Good morning, I'm Jerry Wickham. Uh, I'm a hydrogeologist geologist and caseworker with the Alameda County Environmental Health Local Oversight Program. Alameda County Environmental Health supports State Water Resources Control Board establishing a closure policy that provides clear direction on the conditions that need to be achieved for low threat closure for underground storage tank sites. However, we believe that the current policy can be significantly improved by making changes in several areas which I will briefly describe. In order to make these improvements, we urge the board to make several revisions to the low threat closure policy prior to approval. Many of these changes do not affect the major focus of the policy, which is to increase UST case closure efficiency and provide consistency. Streamlining the case closure process and providing consistency are both worthwhile goals and provide substantial benefits. However, these goals are only achieved when the policy gives clear direction. Let me start with the most significant areas for improvement. The first is site characterization. We can only make good decisions when we have the data necessary to make and support these decisions. As currently written, the level of site characterization required to close sites is not clear. The policy will lead many readers to conclude that site characterization should focus on the narrow parameters considered in the policy. This may have the unfortunate effect of responsible parties requesting case closure based on minimal data that they perceive as meeting the criteria but don't provide an understanding of the actual site conditions. When it is, while it is clear that the policy intends to streamline the closure process, is it also intending to streamline the site characterization process? This is a critical question, but it gets really to the fundamental technical adequacy of the policy. From the presentations provided by members of the task force over the past year, it's our impression the comprehensive site characterization is required to assure compliance with the policy. However, we don't believe readers of the policy would necessarily come to that conclusion based on the content of the policy itself. We're not the only ones who find the intent of the policy unclear in this area as there have been other comments from other reviewers and, and, and during the public comment period. We urge the board to revise the policy to be explicit with regard to the need for adequate site characterization. This requires clarifications that do not necessarily change, result in major changes in the policy, but are of major significance as to whether the policy can be implemented consistently. Uh, second topic, secondary source removal. We support the inclusion of secondary source removal in the policy. Uh, this was an addition from an earlier version and will improve the policy. We thank the, policy, the stakeholders for making this. However, as currently written in the policy, a secondary source is defined as soil or groundwater located at or immediately beneath the point of release from the primary source. It's not clear what's intended by this definition. Is this secondary source removal for the purpose of achieving mass removal of highly contaminated soil and groundwater to allow natural attenuation processes to proceed at faster pace, or is this secondary source removal more narrowly limited to the area immediately below the point of release as stated in the policy? We hope it's the former, that it is the mass removal of highly contaminated soil and groundwater to allow natural attenuation process to proceed. But we can't tell what is intended from the policy as currently written. For practical implementation by a variety of users, the intent of secondary source removal needs to be clarified. Next topic, nuisance criteria. Uh, this is a closure policy that's specific to petroleum hydrocarbons. Therefore, the, the nuisance criteria should be directly applicable to petroleum hydrocarbons. Um, the nuisance conditions described uh, in the policy right now are 
somewhat vague and not likely to be interpreted consistency. Uh, we believe that the policy can be significantly improved by providing parameters that can be applied specifically and directly to petroleum hydrocarbons such as screening levels. Uh, next topic, roles and responsibilities. Uh, the current regulations require the responsible party to assess the nature and extent of contamination and to determine the cost-effective method for cleanup. Uh, the responsible party evaluates the site and proposes corrective action for agency concurrence and review. The entities responsible for the unauthorized release are also responsible for investigation and cleanup. The low threat policy appears to reverse these roles by making closure a presumptive policy and making, the responsibility, making it the responsibility of the regulatory agency to, uh, to review and, and for, for them to uh, be responsible for deciding whether or not the case meets those closure policies. Uh, we believe it's incumbent upon all parties to participate in evaluation of the policy and, and the site and to identify any conditions that would preclude closure. Uh, we recommend that the policy be revised to expand the roles and responsibilities of environmental professionals and responsible parties and not limit the liability the responsibility for evaluating sites to the regulatory agency. Uh, next topic, future use of groundwater. Uh, as currently written, uh, the low threat closure policy applies to unauthorized uh, releases within the area of service area of public water systems. Uh, we recommend that the first general criteria in the policy be amended to indicate that active groundwater basins providing water supplies are not included in the low threat closure policy uh, to recognize the fact that ground drinking water is actively withdrawn, extracted in those areas with water, uh, even though they do have public water supplies. Um, and then lastly, uh, vapor intrusion to indoor air, that topic, uh, we recommend that the policy be revised to include consideration of multiple lines of evidence to evaluate the potential for vapor intrusion to indoor air, and this would be consistent with uh, the practices that, that are currently recommended by other regulatory agencies such as the California Department of Toxic Substance Control and U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you for your opportunity to provide this input. Thank you, Mr. Wickham. Riley Hurd. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Riley Hurd, and I represent Mr. Larry Turner. And I want to start by agreeing with the previous speakers in saying that we support the concept of a policy that facilitates the closure of truly low threat UST sites. The fund is depleted, and there's no doubt that there are sites that are ripe for a streamlined review. And it's because this policy is needed that whatever is passed should do two things. Number one, it should be legally defensible, so it sticks. Number two, it should actually work and achieve its goal. I would submit to the board today that neither of those two things happen with the current version of the policy, but I think the fixes are reasonable and doable. And I've talked about these with your staff and also submitted a lengthy letter, which I will not repeat today. Just touch on a few issues, and the first is the environmental document the SED. It is fundamentally flawed under CEQA, and I think it really strains credulity for this board to suggest that an appropriate baseline for analyzing your decisions is pollution that's already in the ground and already violative of currently applicable laws. The SED uses a baseline that applies to development projects and ignores the fact that this is in fact a policy decision a relaxing of an environmental standard. And what I mean by that is, if you do nothing, the pollution would have to be cleaned up according to the current standards. If you pass the policy, a third of these sites, as approximated by staff, could be closed. So I think the environmental effects of that shift should be meaningfully analyzed, not conveniently ignored by selecting a baseline of pollution that's already in the ground. And this baseline issue then permeates throughout the rest of the SED, um, which, number one, complains that, uh, claims that the policy improves air quality. 
despite all the treatment of uh, vapor issues, number two, and what I believe to be the most egregious, fails to identify one water quality impact resulting from leaving behind these hydrocarbons. I, that, is, that is very difficult to reconcile. Number three, the SED fails to look at a single alternative. And I think as a decision maker, having a range of alternatives presented to you, being able to compare those to the environmental effects would be very, very helpful. The SED, as it's drafted today, will not survive a legal challenge. I want to move on to bioattenuation because it really is the centerpiece of the policy. And I think hanging your hat on a remediation method that requires specific, difficult to achieve site conditions without some control for seeing whether those conditions exist is a very risky proposition if protecting the water is your ultimate goal. And I think the peer reviewers agree with this. They said that leaving hydrocarbons in place with the hopes that they'll simply disappear over time is contingent on oxygen access. So for sites with a building, pavement, irrigation, any kind of barrier, uh, we have a real serious issue with relying on bioattenuation. But I think, like I said at the beginning, this problem's fixable. If, if bioattenuation is going to be a basis, require verification that the sites up for closure can achieve bioattenuating capabilities. A few vapor wells, a few ground monitor, groundwater monitoring wells will tell you if it's working or if after we wait the decades or centuries or longer, the pollutants will simply remain. Before I conclude, I just want to hit on a few quick subjects. Number one, the new standards in this policy will conflict with other agency standards, such as OEHA and others. Number two, tertiary butyl alcohol. TBA is not even mentioned in the policy, and the US EPA has found that it, it will not biodegrade. TBA must be addressed. Number three, property rights. Who's left holding the bag here? Number four, and as we just heard, look at the comments from other water agencies. They're very helpful, and it shows a serious interest in this topic. And number five, and this one is very concerning, there are reports that sites are already being closed under this draft, unadopted policy. And I think that's really problematic to close sites in anticipation of a policy that's up for consideration. So conclusion is the policy is a good start. It's a great concept. Um, but this belongs in the Luft manual. This should not be a standalone policy. It should be guidance that goes in the Luft manual. And I believe that the board today should instruct staff to come back with an environmental document that complies with the law and a policy that's better aligned to the core mission of this board, which shouldn't be forgotten, the protection of our water resources and the people of the state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Bill Becerra. Well, I'm, I'm Bill Becerra. Uh, I am a property owner, and I just addressed some of my personal concerns that I have uh, as a property owner. I appreciate this opportunity to address the board. Uh, I'm not an attorney. I feel that uh, means of closing a uh, low threat site is, is basically overdue. I wholeheartedly support the positions that were stated by uh, Mr. Hurd as I pres just before me. Um, I think the last comment that Mr. Hurd made was in many cases the property owner could be left holding the bag, so to speak. Uh, if our site was closed as a low threat policy, I feel that perhaps uh, at some time in the future it is possible that a potential buyer might want to again investigate that property to see if there's any remaining contamination that they would be concerned with. And I feel should that happen, I believe under this so low threat policy draft, as I understand it, the underwater, uh, not the underwater, but the underground storage tank fund is completely resolved and any cost incurred there would be uh, borne by, by the property owner. That being said, uh, I'm concerned too that 
if the site was closed or any site was closed, that the regulatory agency has the authority to impose some sort of deed restriction uh, on that property. And I believe that deed restriction uh, was not clearly identified as to what the impact might be to the property owner. But it could easily make that property uh, devalued. And it could also make that property unsellable or at a greatly reduced uh, price. So, in summary, I believe that the State Water Control Board should close sites that are long overdue for closing that meet the criteria that is established by a previous uh, statute. And this acceptable priority uh, uh, should be done without any future delay. And I think that these closings, if they occur, should be unconditional. I don't think there should be just a low threat policy with any future repercussions to a property owner. If it's going to close it, let's close it unconditionally once and for all. That's all I have to say. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Becerra. Lawyer Kevin, uh, Mr. Becerra raised a couple of points that I brought up to you in my briefing as far as deed restrictions and any continuing liability. I think it would be appropriate to address them briefly if you don't mind. Okay. I can go ahead and take the lead. With continuing liability, if the property were to be sold and if further corrective action were necessary because of new information, then the responsible party, meaning the former owner, operator of the tank, or the current landowner could be required to perform cleanup. There is a provision in the underground storage tank cleanup fund law that allows for that. If there is a transfer of property and the case had been closed, the current owner of the property can access the cleanup fund through a previous eligible claim that had been filed on the property. So he wouldn't be on his own on this? Right. If the, the existing property owner would be able to file, submit a claim to the fund based upon that provision. And as it relates to his comments about clouds on the deed or deed restrictions, that as well was the question that I had asked. Which well, we have seen that in the written comments. Commenters are concerned that if there are deed restrictions imposed on the property, that that could devalue the property. Okay. Thank you. But does the policy oppose deed restrictions? There's only one category that requires a deed restriction. So it, it's not a uniform requirement. Not all cases that qualify for closure under this policy okay. require the imposition of a deed restriction. Thank you, Lori. Brad Ledsma. Good morning, Chair Hoffman and other members of the board. My name is Brad Ledesma, and I work for and represent Zone 7 Water Agency. Zone 7 appreciates this opportunity to comment on your draft policy for low threat UST case closure. We also provided written comments in March. Zone 7 is a wholesale water agency that serves the cities of Dublin, Livermore, and Pleasanton, and a vibrant agricultural community. Zone 7 is also the local groundwater management agency for the Livermore Amador Valley Groundwater Basin, and has managed the groundwater basin for over 50 years. The local groundwater basin is, and will always be, the backbone of Zone 7's water supply and storage system. It is the key to providing a sustainable and reliable water supply for over 220,000 people and 3,500 acres of agriculture, seeing the area through years of drought and plenty. Zone 7 is continually working with our local community to protect and manage the local groundwater base in an environmentally friendly manner. And in the future, plans to develop new well fields and add new recharge facilities to improve water storage, water quality, and water supply reliability. Zone 7 does support 99% of the proposed policy. The concept of closing low-risk, leaking underground fuel sites makes good environmental and, as illustrated earlier today, economic sense also. Although the draft policy attempts to protect existing supply wells, it inadequate, inadequately protects beneficial uses of managed groundwater basins because the policy does not account for future plume instability resulting from enhanced conjunctive use operations. A stable plume today might remobilize as conditions change, such as initiating additional recharge and pumping activities or changing levels that might occur during various hydrologic years, not just seasonal variations. 
Consequently, Zone 7 requests or recommends that the board revise the policy so that it does not apply to UST cases overlying managed groundwater basins. Zone 7 would wholeheartedly support this policy with such an amendment. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Your comment. You have a comment? An unrelated comment, I just have to, to say that I had the opportunity to visit with Zone 7 earlier this year and was tremendously impressed with the various water management uh, initiatives in that area. It's good to see you again. Thanks. Thank you. Larry Turner, please. Good morning. I'm Larry Turner and I'm associated with uh, real property owner interest. I've spent uh, over 20 years as an environmental real estate rep, both in the corporate world and the uh, private sector. My purpose today is to speak to the real property interest, a stakeholder group that I felt was underrepresented during the formulation of the draft policy. In addition, I'd like to offer a reasonable alternative to modify or refine, refine the policy based upon input from all of the impacted stakeholders. My position is simple. Like other people in this room today, I see the general benefit of the policy. I find that very ironic that there's nobody who's really saying vote against it in its totality. Most people are saying let's support it. And I do that also. But I think we need an appropriate line of demarcation based upon good science. And I think that needs to be identified in a manner that protects the interest of property owners. Now, I was told that Sioma had property owner interests represented at the, through the stakeholder process. But I make note of the fact that many of those property owners were also the responsible parties. They owned and operated the service station. Most of my clients are different in that they are not the responsible party. You, you can't always equate the responsible party and property owner this one and the same. And I have a, an unfortunate circumstance where I have an innocent adjacent down gradient property owner who's being affected by this. He had no contractual relationship with the, with the uh, responsible party. So it's very difficult for him to get any form of remedy. Um, I submitted letters on March 15th, and you have both of them in, uh, in your public record. In, in that correspondence, I pointed out that, that uh, historically you've given a no further action letter. And I call that the gold standard of the industry because lenders, uh, purchasers, property owners, they all, they all agree. They get an NFA, they're very happy. But I think what we're doing here today is we're creating a second class or a provisional no further action letter that is stigmatized by the residual contamination left in place to actually attenuate over many years. And I think the key there is that there are no means of verifying that the plume is stable and that natural attenuation is taking place. And this has a major impact to our property owners. The key is the destruction of all monitoring wells that will foreclose any ability to verify the condition of the natural attenuation. The destruction of the monitoring wells will shift the burden of legal and financial responsibility from the property owner, from, excuse me, from the responsible party to the property owner. My recommendation, as I said, is very simple. Leave a limited number of wells, and for purposes today I'll just say three wells, on site to take samples in the future. Forget about quarterly, forget about sem semi-annual. Get together with the scientific community and maybe, maybe only sample them every two or three years or some duration of that scope. And at some point in time then, you will be satisfied that we can move from this second class NFA where the residual contamination is there, that the site can be formally closed. I believe one of the speakers said earlier he would support that. Property owners, absent verification will suffer a stigma. It will diminish the value of the property. They will have difficulty in getting loans at marketable terms. They'll have delays in developing the property and they can't sell or lease the property. Now a, mo a moment ago the question was asked about deed restriction. Well I call it land, re land use restriction slash deed restriction because in fact many local agencies are putting land use restrictions on and it's a real delay when somebody walks in to pick up a permit to do something and is told by a planning or building department, you can't do that because you don't have an FA letter. So we have nine scientific government officials who are blocking development of a site. 
in good faith perhaps, but still they're blocking it and causing delay. And as I mentioned earlier, this doesn't just hit the property owner, but also the innocent and adjacent property owner. If you don't believe there's a stigma, I have a challenge for you. Take your residence. Try to sell it at full value. If you have termites, asbestos, or mold, you won't be able to sell it. It is stigmatized. And, and so I ask you to consider that. I'm going to wrap up here. Mr. Turner, I'm curious. If you have a house that has termites, mold, or whatever the other thing is. No, but if you, you want to buy one, I've got a couple I can it? sell you. I tried to sell it to Kevin Graves earlier, and he didn't buy it. Go ahead, please. But it's the same. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, it's, it's a stigma, and I'm just trying to draw a parallel. Um, in conclusion, like others, I thank you for your efforts. I've, I've spoken to, to the uh, study group and told them that, uh, you know, I think they've worked in good faith very hard. But I ask you to employ good science here to balance the needs of, of California and recognize under CEQA there are social, economic, and cumulative effects. And, and that's what I'm asking you to consider. Thank you very much for your time here today. Thank you, sir. I have to apologize to the next speaker. I can't read your first name. It's someone with the last name of Jacobs that represents the Clearwater Group. Ah. We had we had one of the three that said Olivia, and I wasn't sure. So. I said Olivia. You're Welcome, Olivia. Thank you. My name is Olivia Jacobs. I'm with Clearwater Group. Um, Get a little closer to the microphone, if you would. That, is that better? Um, greetings to the board. Thank you for having this hearing. Um, I have previously submitted a comments letter on March 19, 2012, in regards to the draft low threat underground storage tank case closure policy. Please consider this reference or request to include that letter into this policy's public hearing process. I am the CEO of a small environmental consulting business. I have a staff of 10. Actions by the USTCF, one of your divisions, directly and immediately affect my business and my employees' lives. This policy threatens our livelihood. I am one of probably a thousand small co companies in the same situation in the state of California. I am speaking up for the thousand silent business owners who could not get away from their respective desks. I'm also an REA and an NEM, and I review the Clearwater Technical Work product. My company's ability to broker environmental case closures for fuel release sites will be seriously challenged by the proposed policy's residual conflict areas. In my comments letter, I included flow diagrams for the case closure decisions where negotiations are required, and activity referred to as the DRAT loop is shown. D-R-A-T stands for Depends on Regulator and Technology. This has been an area for conflict, and the policy will not change that problem. To summarize, our ability to broker case closures driven by safety and science with the objective of managing future liability or health risk will not be easier if the policy is installed. This draft policy allows the residual current conflicts between current laws and regulator interpretations to persist. We will continue in this period of impairment if this policy is not modified. Those residual conflicts we already had will increase and will necessarily migrate, just as residual contamination soil slowly leaches into the groundwater unless it is treated or removed. The USDCF five-year review team letters, the USTCF 2011-2012 budgets, and now this draft policy pose a high threat to us. And I am speaking for many others. Board members, please focus your time and your staff time on these six issues. First, recent peer reviews, regulatory comments, and the previous public comments have been largely ignored during the evolution of the policy, not just recently, but over the past three years. Pushing this issue to the courts would waste time and precious resources which are needed to address the problem, which is writing a usable and legally defensible policy. This policy, second, this policy compromises the ethics of professionals tasked with protecting the waters of the state. Third, the policy must be amended with vetting by a complete cadre of stakeholders, not a small subset of stakeholders, the stakeholder group. The following stakeholders, and this is not a complete list, have been left out of the process. The people of California, 
Local oversight programs, for example, county, city, fire agencies overseeing the cleanup work, local and regional planners, environmental industry businesses, real property owners, adjacent property owners, financial institutions, real estate industry, responsible parties, sensitive receptors, and other state agencies. Fourth, a consumer protection element to the process is absent. When progress on cleanups is blocked, responsible parties, oversight agencies, consultants, and the RWCBs do not have a platform to openly resolve conflict in a technically sound and fiscally responsible manner. Fifth, GeoTracker. GeoTracker needs a contaminant plume identification and hazard communication element. This superb database site lacks a real-time visual of contaminant point and plume presence both on-site and especially off-site from the release location. Sixth, the policy must address the issue of triage of release sites, a ranking of the sites and cleanup by degree of risk. In summary, here are the main points. Please, direct the production of a technically usable and legally defensible policy. Second, do not place stamping professionals in an adversarial relationship with your board. Third, please institute a true stakeholders group. Fourth, please implement a consumer protection function. Fifth, please authorize coding of the GeoTracker program to show current contaminant conditions. And sixth, please address triage of the sites. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Olivia. Would John Cochran come forward, please? John? Good morning, Chair Hoppin and board members. John Corcoran. I'm here because I want to ask the board um, not to use the state's short-term financial problems as a reason to implement a policy that would have long-term harmful environmental effects. I agree with prior speakers who have said that the policy is a step in the right direction, but I believe and I agree with those speakers who said that it needs more work. I also want to agree with the speakers who said that with regard to CEQA, that the CEQA process has not been followed here. I find it hard to believe that there can be no significant environmental effects by this policy, especially in light of the fact that when the State Board adopted the idea of containment zones, they expressly acknowledged that leaving contaminants in the ground was a significant effect. I find that to be inconsistent. Another major issue here is uh, with regard to the policy is inconsistency internally with state board regulations and externally with regard to other agency standards. For example, using the levels proposed here, a site uh, would already be considered a nuisance under the Porter Cologne Water Quality Act. It doesn't make any sense to use set in stone soil con contamination levels which completely disregard any site specific analysis. I believe there should be greater flexibility. There's a letter in the record also I'd like to point to your attention submitted by Patrick Hogan of Weber Hayes and Associate uh, that I believe is very clear. I'd like to draw your attention to that letter. It has a table on page one that shows existing cleanup goals compared to the proposed new limits. That table shows how dramatically limits would be increased under this policy. Every fuel contaminant uh, limit would go up significantly. I also want to uh, address also uh, an issue regarding liability for real property owners. Um, it would, I submit that it would create great uncertainty, uh, uncertainty for policy owners uh, where properties have petroleum hydrocarbon contamination left behind in the soil in the groundwater for years or for decades. I think it's still unclear how issues will be handled by future property owners. Uh, there could be unanticipated consequences related to who is financially responsible for liabilities, how contaminated soils should be handled, and what should happen if contaminated soils migrate across property lines. Uh, I think this policy needs to be further refined with regard to that. Finally, I just want to say that closing cases with elevated concentrations of petroleum hydrocarbons in groundwater will have a negative impact on water quality and water resources. Uh, potentially for generations, so we ask that you proceed slowly and, and with caution before you approve this new proposal. Thank you. I, 
I just wanted to ask, uh, who are you representing, or yourself, or? On behalf of myself. On behalf of yourself, thank you. Thank you, sir. James Jacobs. Chairman, uh, members of the board, I'm James Jacobs. I'm a geologist. I'm representing myself. Certainly agree that streamlining and updating the process uh, for case closure is needed, and I agree that the, that, that effort has been started. The proposed policy to, should be carefully checked to be consistent with existing guidelines and laws which are protective of the environment. Beneficial use, adequate use of science and exposure risk analysis should be part of a relevant case closure process. Thank you, sir. Danielle Blassett. Sorry, a little shorter. Um, Chairman Hoffman and members of the board, thank you uh, for your time today. My name is Danielle Blassett with the Association of California Water Agencies. Our 440 members represent public water agencies throughout the state. Um, we're, our policy document, Sustainability from the Ground Up, recognizes the importance of groundwater resources and the challenges faced by agencies in areas with groundwater contamination. First, I want to acknowledge staff for their efforts and the stakeholder group that has developed the current draft of the policy. As we know in our efforts, it's not always the easiest or fastest path to a solution. <coughs> Excuse me. But we feel bringing together diverse perspectives increases the potential for an effective implementation of a policy. And so we appreciate the, the work that you've done thus far. And we also appreciate when our agencies can participate in that process. And we understand that Orange County Water District, <coughs> excuse me, was part of that. So we appreciate that, um, that inclusion. Um, and this is an important issue. And so. Uh,